Hey there, everyone. It's Madeline here back again. Um, next up, we have Alexis Quaresma, who's going to come on and talk, give us a lighting presentation today. Uh, Alexis, are you here? Are you in the house? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. You're coming on now. So I just want to say I'm really, really happy that you're here. Um, this has been a long time coming. I know you've you know, recently created some content with our social team, and I've, I've checked out a bunch of the podcasts on our YouTube channel as well. So, But I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. I'm a big fan of your box. Being that I'm a boxer, I'm a big fan of your, your boxing shots. You have some of the most amazing boxing images I think I've ever seen. So it's really cool to have you on and, and be able to listen to you talk about that work. But um, welcome. I do want to say, um, again, if you guys have any questions as Alexis is speaking, you can put them in the chat and I'll make sure that I um, ask him as he's presenting, if that's okay with you, Alexis. Yeah, um, totally. Awesome. So make sure you, you put those in the chat. And I'm going to pretty much let you take the stage um, and and start giving your presentation whenever you're ready you have the screen share up are you able to i see you here yep i think so so uh let's see yeah it should be it should be coming up yeah you, you're good now awesome there you go cool um i just want to say if anyone's watching and you have any questions please feel free to answer them in the chat i won't be seeing the chat but maddie will uh and maddie if there's any questions that are good please feel free to just stop awesome ask me yeah i will um, yeah, I want this to be as interactive as possible, guys. So uh, if you have any questions while I'm talking, please feel free to ask anything about um, lighting, cameras, or, or anything you want. Um, hopefully, we can talk a little, something a little bit more, more deeper than, than, than just gear. But um, let me just uh, uh, start here. This is just going to be an uh, overview of my work for people who are not familiar with it. Um, but I've been a photographer for 15 years, um, and I started shooting uh, action I started working, uh, actually, I really started shooting Little League, my brother, because that's uh, uh, what I had access to. And then I worked my way up to, uh, you know, high school. And then from there, was able to shoot uh, professional athletes. Um, but in the process of doing that, I photographed everything. I photographed, like I said, Little League, uh, high school action, engagement session, weddings. And what I really found that I loved uh, was the more produced images instead of the found images. So uh, that led naturally to um, lighting, you know, the, the, the images and into portraiture. And uh, uh, what I love about portraiture, uh, which you can see some of the work here, um, is uh, getting to know the person. Uh, but more importantly for me, not only getting to know the person and interpret how I interact with them, how I feel with them, and translating that visually. Um, and that's basically um, what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, um, my approach to lighting, at least. So. This talk is about the fundamentals of lighting. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different things um, and, uh, and not just uh, gear, because gear, gear is important, but I think it's more important about like the concept and what, what you're trying to say and why you're trying to say it. And then also talking about um, motivation and, and inspiration behind an image and, uh, uh, and why you take an image. So here we go, let me get out of this. So there you go, that's my... Like the overview body of my work, that slideshow that you saw there is the overview in my portfolio website. So those are about, um, those are 36 images on my overview of my website that I feel represent my work and what I like to shoot. And uh, that's, that's a good overview. So let's just get started into, um, into the presentation. So uh, for, for me, uh, you know, when people talk about lighting a lot, the number one argument that people have or they like to talk about is natural light versus um, uh, natural light versus uh, you know artificial light or strobe lighting, and I think uh, in just in my opinion that's the uh, wrong question to uh, ask because um, when it comes to lighting, I think the the more important question to ask is lighting style. It, just in my opinion, there, there's two different ways to approach lighting and lighting styles that you have. Uh, there's just two basic concepts overall. Um, so one of them is naturalistic. Um, you know, generally people that are, you know, they do natural light like this one. So naturalistic is motivated by reality. 
and you're showing an accurate representation of reality of what's there. Uh, so generally for this, the images tend to not look lit. Uh, if something is lit, it has a, a motivation. And what I mean by motivation uh, is that if there's a light up, there's a reason why the light's there, right? It's motivated by a window or sunlight or sunset or, or anything like that, or light bouncing from, from ice or snow or anything like that. So that has a, that's one particular lighting style. And then the other lighting style that there is, it's an it's expressionist uh, lifestyle. Uh, lighting style. And that's much more motivated by emotion and representing a mood, emotion and feel that you're trying to portray in your image. Um, so these are two way different approaches and different concepts of lighting. Uh, neither is right or wrong. Um, I know um, a lot of times when people teach, they, they tend to teach a certain specific way and they say, oh, you know, when you light, you do X, Y, and Z, or you do steps one, two, and three. And a lot of people want to learn that way. Um, and, and, you know, that is a, a way to learn and that is a way to teach. But in, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the, the, the best way. You need to kind of assess every situation that you're in uh, and see which, which situation works for best. Um, generally speaking, if your images have a function and you need to portray something, uh, for example, like, you know, these just ones a passport photo. Uh, you know, you're going to have to, you know, have flat lighting, you have to see the person, you can't get dramatic, and, you know, and abstract them visually with colors or, or you know, dark, moody lighting. Uh, but if something more, more expressionist, again, like more creative, um, the sky's the limit, you could do whatever you want. So out of these two styles, um, I could shoot both, but the one that if you recognize my images, or, or if you see uh, any image uh, that, that if I have the full creative choice, I choose the bottom the expressionist uh, to, to uh, again, always like for, for emotion. So um, again, here are some of the difference. So this is right here lighting for um, obviously e emotion right here, like realistically, like, right, that doesn't look real at all. Like the colors um, don't necessarily, while they're complementary, they don't make sense. But everything is dark and moody. Like if you were to try to recognize either of these dancers, you more than likely wouldn't be able to recognize them um, just because of the way the lighting is. But again, I wasn't trying to create an image so you could see them and and portray them. And uh, I, again, I was going more for a mood and a feeling. So for the image on the right, like the overall concept of uh, uh, that's Nakisha. She's a principal for from San Francisco Ballet. Um, I was going way more on abstract inspiration on you know what the colors from the sunset will look like maybe in the evening you know so i put two lights in the back to represent the cool warmth of a sunset that you see and the night was represented on her with a, a dark magenta and a blue uh and, and again that's purely lighting for artistic and creative uh reasonings and something uh much more for um let me pull up the, the next image let's see and uh, so here you go. So this is the next image. So this is way more of a naturalistic light source uh, or just naturalistic looking image. Um, and you could see how she actually looks and you could see everything. And then this one, the light is not drawing attention to itself. So these are decisions that you have to make, you know, um, as a creative, as a photographer, uh, whether you're shooting, it, this, does, this applies to anything. These are dancers, but it applies to athletes. Um, all the athletic work that I've gotten, all the athletes that I've been able to photograph, um, thankfully, you know, have been because of the style that I'm able to do and I'm able to produce. Again, so again, this is more um, like of a, a expressionist uh, uh, image because you can see just all the colors here and everything. And then again, that's Sasha. And then that's more of the naturalistic one where you can actually see how she looks. And again, kind of going back and forth to where people like to argue natural light versus um, strobe lighting or artificial lighting. It, it, you know, if you're going to be a professional and you need to produce these images, you need to be able to produce them on a consistent basis, day or night. Uh, so, for example, this image of Sasha is just a lighting setup, which is the same exact one that you see here with Nakisha. So now these were shot on separate days, separate locations, um, you know, and you're able to dial them in and make them look, you know, pretty similar. And that's what, you know, being able to use lighting and bringing strobes uh, gives you as a professional, instead of just relying on, on natural light, on, on direct sunlight or, or a cloudy day, you know, which is nice. It's beautiful if it's there. You know, there's nothing wrong. I'm not knocking it. Um, but again, when you find yourself in a situation, if you're working 
with, you know, with talent <clears throat> that's professional, whether they're athletes, actors, or whatever, you, you know, you might have to take a shot that looks like sunlight, you know, at 8 p.m. because that's only their availability. And you as a creative have to be able to produce that. So again, a lot of people say they tend, they, they tend to love, you know, natural light because it's more natural, a person is more relaxed and, and they love this look and they love this image like this. Um, but for example, if you know lighting and you want to light naturalistic, this shot is 100% lit by strobes. Um, and that's the setup that you see for this image right here. Uh, she's actually lit by one, two, three. I think I had uh, four. I had five lights uh, on this one. Um, <clears throat> but if you could see there, she's completely in the shadow in the dark. Um, and then I took one shot um, with all the lights off except the rim light. And that's the only one you see. I don't have it here. But if, but if you look, if you know lighting right here, if you want to light it, light it so it looks naturalistic, so it doesn't look lit, um, and you know lighting, and you know the, the approach you want to do, you could create anything you want um, with lighting. Um, and if you, uh, if, I'll just go over the setup here real fast, um, uh, if uh, people want to know. But uh, generally, and they're like again, so since, since this was done for uh, "quote unquote" naturalistic light, um, everything is motivated as if it was being lit by sunlight. So if you see there, that's um, I believe it's a six foot by six foot. Uh, it's called a lanternite by Manfrotto, um, and there's two strobes um, firing into that. And that's literally just replicating what the window lighting would be right next to her. And that's kind of just flooding her all the way with light. And if you see there, I have a, um, a, a, a small octobox above. And that octobox is pretty much just replicating, if I was shooting that with natural light, uh, what a, where a reflector would be. Uh, and again, all these are shot, um, well, this image in particular is shot wide open at f2.8 because that's the look that people like, or the, uh, you know, and the people and the look people tend to, to go for when they're shooting natural light, because the one that shot will definitely field. And then the other two lights that I have, <clears throat> excuse me, in this one, is I have a light boomed up behind her that's providing the, the rim light on her. And then the other light is in the background um, that's just literally lighting the background. Because remember, this is 100% lit, lit by strobes. So if I didn't have a light hitting the back wall, uh, it would be completely dark. Uh, and, and actually, if I wanted to go back and make this image and make it more realistic or make it look more better, I would make it less perfect. The light on the background, I would probably increase it by a stop and overexpose it by a bit. Because if you always look at images that are shot by natural light, they're not really balanced or, perf or perfectly lit because sunlight goes everywhere and your exposure is not going to be balanced out the whole time. And again, here's an example of another image. Um, this is a natural light. This is a shot that I did, a basketball shoot that I did with Tyler. Um, again, it was beautiful. We were waiting here on, um, we got both Tyler and I got there real early at the basketball gym. Uh, so we were waiting on the team to arrive, the, the stylist and the makeup artist and the groomer uh, for the shoot. And I just did a quick shot and there was beautiful sunlight uh, beaming uh, through the windows. We did that quick uh, crash, quick shot right here, which, which again, it's beautiful, it's great. However, you need to be prepared that if that's a look that the client wanted or you wanted to produce, um, you need to be able to replicate that on demand if you wanted to um, uh, for, for a client. Uh, so for this image, I actually just took it because I really liked it. And then I went back and kind of uh, um, just reassessed and talked to you know, the team I, I got for work with to how to recreate this. If I wanted to, if it was nighttime, uh, you know, and again, it would be with a couple high rollers outside and then blasting a few uh, pro photo uh, magnums um, uh, through those windows and, and filling up the, the gym with haze. So again, natural light's beautiful, is there. Uh, you can use it as inspiration and as motivation. Uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when we're working for clients, we need to be able to create images on demand. So this was just a nice image that was happened to be there. Uh, and we shot it. So just to give you a comparison, this is 100% lit by strobes. Um, and this gives you 100% control of the image. You could produce, produce, produce this anytime, day or night. And um, again, obviously the difference is on, on the amount of gear you need. This is just natural light. It's just a quick snapshot that I shot. This image is more produced and more thought out. And uh, this one requires planning and a lot of gear. So that's pretty much the setup for, for this image, um, which again, it requires a lot of gear. So for, for this image, uh, it required two Pro Photo uh, 10A packs, and they were both on high rollers above the, the rim. 
and uh, the Profoto 1080 packs were 2,400 watt seconds. So they were both at full power. Uh, and realistically, I should have had uh, um, buy heads and had two packs on them because they give you extra stop of light. Uh, but on this one, I'm playing with the colors too as well, which is something again, that I'm lighting for, uh, lighting uh, for visual impact and for, you know, to light for emotion. If I wanted to light, you know, for more naturalistically, uh, I would have made the light draw less attention to itself and made the colors less prominent um, and done more top lighting, which is kind of more, more natural for, for any basketball gym. Uh, but on this one, if you see here the setup, uh, I just have a high roller, which you could see here on this image on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, and that high roller is about, I want to say, 14 feet in the air and as far back as we can. Uh, and the reason why you need um, a really powerful pack on this one, which is a 2,400 watt second power pack at full power, is because there's no way around it. The light has to be as far away as possible from the rim as you can because of the inverse square law. If that light is right up against the rim and you have it there really close, that rim is going to be completely blown out of nuclear uh, for, for the athlete to get any lighting on them. Uh, so in order for the light, uh, for you to be able to see the rim and also light the player, the light has to be as far back as possible. Uh, so you get less light fall off. And in order for the light to be backed up as much as you can, um, uh, what do you call it? The, um, you just need a lot of power. There's, there's, there's no way around that. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one light that I had there. And then on the other side, I had another light, uh, uh, which was another Profoto 10A at full power. And then that one had a full CTO gel. I generally like to combine CTO and CTS gels is overcorrected. And then I dropped my white balance to anywhere between 3,200 and 2,500 Kelvin. And what that does is that turns that light by the rim, it makes it turn blue. And then the reason, again, why the light in the back is gelled and not the one in the front because when you gel lights, you could lose a stop uh, up to two stops of light, depending on how much you correct it. Because all gelling light, uh, a light does is, is, is literally blocking light rays from, from your light source and it's cutting up, it's cutting up the power. Uh, so in this one, like I said, the light on the rim needed to be really powerful and it needed to be as far as away as the rim as I could get it. Uh, so you could get that light, uh, the beam of light lighting the rim and also uh, Tyler going in there for the basketball done. Uh, so again, these are all the, the, the that's the, all the gear that required for, for that image. And again, going back to uh, natural light, this is a shoot that I did um, not that long ago. I did it with uh, Mario Barrios. Uh, he's a WBA champ, uh, champion who has a big fight coming up. Um, his team hired me to do a gallery of images uh, to help promote him. And on, in this particular situation, we had everything planned out. I was working with the stylist. Um, they wanted to do um, fashion type images. So as soon as they said that to me, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are just focused on lighting gear, lighting gear and retouching. Um, but I think a lot of the things that uh, there's something that a lot of photographers in general overlook, uh, especially I know when I when I speak to students uh, in, you know, in graduating schools and I see their senior portfolios, they, they want to shoot fashion or, or, or anything. And they put all this focus and attention into the lighting, into the retouching, into what camera they're using. Um, but they, I think they, no pun intended, they, they missed the overall big picture of things is um, if you're trying to do um, fashion or, or, or any type of images, what's more important is not only the type of, the, the model that you could get, the caliber of model, uh, model you could get, <coughs> but also the clothing that the talent is wearing. So as soon as um, you know, Mario's team told me that they wanted some fashion images, the first thing that I, I said that we need to do is get on board is uh, hire one of my favorite stylists from LA, it was Ali Morgan. Um, you know, and she set up the shoot and, and made it look the way it needed to be. Because no matter how well I lit these images, that would go all go out the door if, it's, if it wasn't properly styled or dressed properly. Uh, so that's you know, one of the biggest things for, for the shoot. So in this one, you know, I had a creative call with a stylist. Uh, and the talent, which was Mario and myself, we all kind of came up with a look. Um, but going back to the lighting uh, on this image, like I said, we planned absolutely everything for the shoot. And uh, um, uh, Ali made a mood board. We put all the lighting and in, in the outfits together. And, uh, you know, we had the particular look that we wanted. But on the day of the shoot, when we arrived, uh, there was this roll up there. When I rolled it up, there happened to be this beautiful sunlight pouring in. 
And I knew it wasn't going to be there for a long time. So I took advantage of it and I just put up a V flat, which is here, a V flat from V flat world. Um, and I told Ali, I'm like, Hey, you know, let's push back the, you know, the first look that we had planned, which was 100% lit and strobe. And I said, let's take advantage of, uh, uh, the sunlight pouring in here. Cause it's going to be gone any minute. Um, and that's just being mobile and flexing that. So that's just a quick setup. And then, uh, that's this photo of Mario right here. Uh, and that's the, the result. And, and, and again, this was just with natural light for me is if, if it's there awesome um but i don't really rely on it um it, it's a great it, it's a great bonus um but but again this was just a look that was kind of just a gift to us on, on that day and uh, uh it was just wasn't planned at all and these are actually some of my favorite images uh now looking at these images uh right if i had to go back and i had to recreate them let's say with another boxer or, or if a talent said and said oh you know i really like these images um you know, uh, I, you know, I need to make them like I couldn't rely on, on just sunlight this time of day and and, um, and like the situation or because literally this this setup went away uh, like in 20 minutes after that, a cloud came, blocked the sun and, and it was gone. And then so we just have to shut the door and continue on with with the plan that we had. Uh, but if I had to recreate this, I would just take, a, you know, a Fresnel uh, light. I would take um, depending on the budget, you know, if you had a really, really good budget, you know, I would take like 18K to my light, which is my favorite light. Just put it up there and it will give you a real similar look to this. Um, if the budget wasn't the high, I'll use the LED. Um, the Aperture 600D, you know, with their, um, with their optical zoom spot, it will give you a very similar look to this one. Uh, or I would use the strobe, you know, with the, with the, also, oh, with the optical zoom spot, which would give you a similar look to this too as well. Uh, but again, that's natural light and that's doing absolutely just having him face the light and then putting the V flap behind them to block off the environment and then ju just photographing them there. So that's taking advantage of, you know, the natural light that's there. And uh, another thing too, when you're shooting and you're doing anything with natural light or even with strobes is to just, when you're doing an image, don't just shoot, you know, look good from one angle here, he's facing the light. And this is the same exact, uh, you know, quote unquote lighting setup. It's just that roll up door open. And if you look here, that highlight on him, uh, it's just instead of having him facing the light, I had him face away from the light and it provides a beautiful rim light. And then I just took the V flat and I took the, uh, the, the side that's black and flipped it out to the white and I just bounced back light into him. And that gives you a, two setups, two different looks with the same exact just sunlight coming in and, and just keeping it, you know, really light, real basic and, and getting different looks, multiple looks and taking full advantage of, you know, of what's there. And again, I always love to, um, I, I, again, light for emotion and I wanted to draw attention to the highlight and the light and that blooming that you see is there is done in camera. And in this particular case is done with the Hoya white mist filter. Uh, some people may like that look, some people don't. I know that's, that's certainly to taste. I personally love it. Uh, and I wanted to draw attention to the highlights on this one. So you put that white mist filter on it and it'll make those highlights bloom when they're overexposed on this image. And again, this is just kind of a third look from the same exact look. This is just that roll-up door and that's direct sunlight. He's just facing it right there. Uh, and I, what I did on this one is I exposed directly for the sunlight. And what you do is you, you expose with your light meter or the camera you expose with the, the spot meter. Um, and when you expose for any area that's hit directly by the sunlight, it's gonna make everything else go black. Um, and if you look on his neck uh, right there, just a little bit of a, of a rim light. And, and again, that's just that V flat there on the white side, kicking up a little bit of light. Uh, so you could see on his left hand, the, the glove right there, you could see on the right side of the glove, um, there's a little bit of a rim light and on the back of his neck, that's because I had that V flat, the white bounce card there bouncing in a little bit of light. Otherwise he would just go all black, which would be, which can be a great look uh, if you wanted to, but on that one, I just want a little bit of separation. Um, and another thing I can, uh, I just want to talk about on, um, on the on this image right here uh, uh let me go back um which is uh the one with the highlight uh this one uh there's a lot of different concepts that people like and that people will teach you uh so for example if you look on this image the rim light and the light coming at him are both coming from the same side um, i did that because of the way the light was coming in and the way it was bouncing generally i like the light on my subject to be opposite the rim light. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because depending on who teaches you lighting, uh, they'll have different rules and they'll tell you, oh, like, you know, I, I light it naturalistic. So 
the light source on my subject and the rim light has to be coming from the same side. Um, you know, and if you do the other way around, it looks unnaturalistic because that doesn't happen in nature and, and, you know, and all this stuff. And I just want to, you know, make the point here that there's no right or wrong answer. You look creative and in this, any situation like this, do what works for you and do what creatively what you like and the emotion that you want for your image. Uh, in this situation, it just happened that the light on the subject, on the balance and the rim light came from the same side. But generally, again, I like for visual impact and I like my light on the subject to be opposite of the rim light. Um, and again, the reason why someone might say they don't like that or why they don't like the rim light is because the light is drawing attention to itself. And depending on the goal of your image, you might not want the light to draw attention to itself. Um, generally, if something is drawing attention to itself, it should be for a reason. Otherwise, it's a distraction. So that's just something to keep in mind, again, where you're lighting. Um, and, and, and again, the, the, the theme of this course is the fundamentals of lighting. And I think that's a really, really important concept and uh, foundation of uh, your lighting and when you're learning lighting on, on the approach that you're taking. Okay, cool. So let me just go here and just show some other things. Um, give me one second, let me switch. Uh, Matt, is there any questions so far? Not yet. I do want to remind everybody, if you have any questions for Alexis, please do put them in the chat and we will, I'll make sure I interrupt you if anything comes up in the meantime. So. Okay, cool. I, will, I do, I do. I don't know if you want to speak about it. I kind of have a question for you. Yeah, go um, ahead. I want to hear a little bit about um, the process of making a book and select, I know you're working on, you know, a project right now, um, maybe talking about, you know, some of the, the, the process behind the editing and what goes into image selection. Um, what, what, what's some of the backstory on that? On uh, making the book, basically um, the way I, I am doing the, the book, the ballet book, um, is the one I'm talking about. It, it's, uh, um, I am shooting it or editing it. The way I edited it and laid out the image was uh, kind of in the, in the way that I shot it. So the first dancer that I got to work with uh, was Christine Shevchenko. Um, and on that one, I, I, I'm calling her act one. And then Joseph Walsh is the second person that I photographed, you know, he's act two. And then Sasha, the solo was the third dancer feature on I'm calling her act three. And the way I'm doing this, I'm just introducing the dancers in the order that I met them and the, pro and the amount of work that I got to work with. So with, with Christine Shevchenko, I got to work with her for three days. Um, we did a short film and also a photo shoot. And that was in 2018. Uh, so the way uh, with her, I got to work with her the most because I got to follow her um, when she was training uh, or practicing with her, with her personal trainer. And so I did reportage images of her. And then we also did an entire day where we did just, you know, stylized uh, images and, and, and uh, photograph and portraits. And then uh, we also did a short film too. So uh, for, for her section, I'm talking about the introduction, how I met her and showing all the reportage images. Then I'm moving on to a quick introduction to, to Joseph uh, and how I connected with him and I met him. And then the third one is Sasha. Um, and then I'm just talking about, you know, like introduction, how I connected with her and her, her images and I guess that entire journey on there because I worked only with Christine and there's supposed to be just a one-off shoot with her to do a short film and photos but I ended up loving working with her so much that I wanted to continue this body of work and um, I'm talking about um, one of the, the, the texts that I'm working on the book is talking about the process going you know working with Christine and then how I continue that work to be able to get more dancers and you know, kind of that journey, how I ended up working with, you know, Joseph and Sasha, which was a complete like gift because uh, I wasn't supposed to work uh, with either of them because um, after I worked with Christine, I had somebody else reach out to me uh, that wanted to work with me. And, and again, this is another big thing just in photography uh, and in general. And uh, the other person that wanted to work with me ended up just completely kind of going MIA on me uh, despite, you know, seeing my work, despite them reaching out to me and saying they, they wanted to work with me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I had everything planned. I had the studio, I had, I had we had everything done and, and they kind of just went MIA. And I know in general, for a lot of people, that could be really disheartening 
and you know and you could lose all your motivation uh but the whole entire reason you know for being able to create that book and, and continue that body of work is not giving up and saying okay cool that person whatever you know they're going through whatever i can't let that you know stop me uh, so i'm going to go out and reach out to other people and you know not, not to get you know uh, uh all you know deep on this but I, you know i just like to say like the universe kind of makes way for for you to connect with the people who you should be connected to because if that person would not have flexed on me i would have never connected with you with joseph and especially sasha and sasha's been an absolute dream to work with and i've ended up working with her like on six seven shoots um i did a shoot with her actually with canon um and um I, i've worked with her on a number of different occasions and i just go back on thinking to that that i'm so thankful that that person um uh, did not, uh, uh, that actually that the person actually flaked on me because if they would have never done that, I would have never connected with Sasha. Uh, so that's part of the process too that, I, that I'm writing in the copy in the book and talking about that process. So when photographers see it, that can hopefully, you know, motiv motivate them too, because um, a lot of people think, oh, you get to work with X, Y, and Z, or, or you've worked with so-and-so, so things are really easy. Um, they, they never are. Things always happen like this. And then um, the only difference is that, um, the only reason that body of work exists that's called Destined for Greatness is on the website is just because I didn't give up. You know, even though, you know, someone canceled on me or flaked on me, I still kept trying. I still kept pushing it. And I still kept the wheels turning on my own. Uh, and, and I think that's just kind of the whole, like, kind of analogy or concept of being a photographer in general or a director is um, you, you need to have a stronger will than everybody around you. Because um, even people that have, you know, the, the, that want to give you doubts or hate on you, uh, they're going to tell you that and your, your will and your, your reasons need to be stronger than their, you know, than, than theirs. Cause you'll certainly have people that try to talk you out of things and you just got to be able to laser focus and, you know, keep going on your projects and what you want to do. That's a I good, know that was a really long answer to that question. Maddie. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> a good, good story too. Um, I want to, I also have another question I wanted to ask you. Yeah going back to this beautiful image that you shot in the gymnasium of the, the basketball player doing the dunk. I think he's going for a dunk. I'm not sure. Yep. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, but like how much pre-production and planning goes into an image like that? I mean, I know, I know you spoke on, you know, setting up, you know, I, it was a different shot. I'm not sure if it was the same shoot looks kind of similar, but using the light outside, you know, with the magnums and sort of, do you go, do you go scope out a location before you shoot it? Like, do you have, do you find that you often have the opportunity even to do that? Can you tell us a little bit about that process of like shooting in a new location and working with an athlete? Like how much of planning will go into a shoot like this? Um, if you can get a lot of planning done, you know, it's usually it's great. Um, but a lot of the times um, it, it just depends on, on who you're working with. Scouting days are great if you could do them. But I, I just find a lot of the times um, uh, I try to get there as early as possible. And um, when I get there as early as possible, I, that's usually my scouting trip. I can't, um, sometimes I don't get to see the, the, the spot. Or if you're working with a film crew, um, a lot of the times you're, the scouting, if you're not with the film crew, the scouting is almost pointless. Uh, because, for example, like when I, when I did a shoot with Draymond Green, I had an entire look I wanted uh, um, to execute and, and I had everything planned out. And then the second I arrive on set and, and, you know, I arrived, I think I want to say like three hours early. And the second I, I arrived on set, the cinematographer came up to me and they're like, oh, okay, 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 you're free here for stills. All right, cool. You can't set up in this entire area because we have a white shot and it's overlooking everything here. So that could put like just threw out all my plans out the window because I couldn't pre-light anything. Uh, so in that particular situation, anything, you know, that I had, um, that I had planned had to be thrown out the window because I couldn't, it, it had to be a lighting setup where it was simple enough and short enough to, it couldn't be seen. And then from the time he got done doing the interview to by the time he walked over me, it had to be set up. Uh, so like in that situation like that, like, like, you know, you kind of just have to work on the fly. Um, but with that being said, it's always good to, you know, scout it out. It's always good to have a game plan and in, um, had everything planned out but you also got to be really prepared for situations like that and be mobile and be flexible um because if something happens um and you need to move and switch you, you can't just be frozen and and you know and just rely on your plan and say oh well, this was my plan and i couldn't do it and then you know 
and, and, then, and then fail at uh, creating any images. You have to be able to produce it. So scouting is great. Uh, like on, on that shoot with the basketball player, um, there was no scouting. I, um, I think I just got some photos of the gym. And I knew it was a large gym, so I had to get a professional hazer. I got, the, that was the DF. It's called DF50. Um, and that's the first thing I did when I got there. I just ran the hazer because I knew I would have to um, haze the entire gym. And so I hazed it for about two hours to get it to where the level needed to be. And then I just started setting up the lights. Um, and then again, where you're lighting with strobes, the beautiful thing, and you're indoors, is, is you, you get a lot of control of the lighting. And I just overpowered all the, all the, the ambient lighting in there for the most part. Um, and shot it but uh, um but again the, the, usually i do pre-planning and and i scout it out um, i will talk about this uh, a little bit more in, in this ne next section but um uh yeah if you could pre-plan in this great but a lot of times um, especially again working with professional athletes you're gonna have to be you know flexible on on, on, on what you need to do because you got everything planned of had situations where the athlete doesn't want to go where you, you're supposed to photograph them and they're just gonna oh, just 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 shoot me here and then that throws everything out your window and you're going to get just a few minutes with them and you, you got to make it work. I've got another one for you in terms of color palette. Is that something that you just decide in advance and are you creating any sort of like mood board or, I mean, obviously for a commercial shoot, you'll have references in advance, but you know, when you're going out and you're sort of just spending time with these athletes, is there a certain type of color palette that you envision prior to the shoot? Or is it more something that you go as the shoot sort of evolves, you decide how you want the images to come out? You know, it's generally, um, that's a good question for when I'm working with professional athletes, if you look at, at my work on professional athletes with personal work, uh, I, I generally use less color with professional athletes because I have less time. And those images generally have to serve a function where you need to recognize that athlete. Uh, and, and I just don't have a lot of time. Like if you look at the U.S. Women's National Team, when I shot for, for Sports Illustrated a few years ago, it, uh, um, it, it barely, it has like no color on it. They're all like this, um, uh, just, just your, your regular standard daylight balance. Because um, on that one, I only had 10 minutes with each player. Um, and, and I had to get a close-up medium and, you know, in a full-length shot of all the players. And... And those shoots are really stressful and under the gun. And I need to make sure that I get um, what I need and get them recognizable. And then I treat all those shoots with professional athletes as if they're going to be 30 second shoots because that's, that's what I've had before. Um, so I, I pretend that's all I'm getting. And I start with that and I get my go-to photographs, uh, images that are good, like a tight headshot and a three quarter that's usable for the magazine or whoever. Um, and again, if you're doing that and, you, and you're going into it, that you're only going to get 30 seconds to a minute, you're not going to do anything, you know, creative or abstract with color. Um, and from there, if I, once I get more than 30 seconds or a minute, I go on to something else and I'll generally do different setups and turn off lights and get it more dramatic and moody, but it, it, it just, with professional athletes, it doesn't generally for me get to a point yet where I've been able to play with color. When you see a lot of my color work, it's because it's usually personal work. Um, and on those shoots, I get, um, you know, three hours, at least a couple hours at minimum. Uh, for th that shoot with Christine Shevchenko with that dancer, I worked with her 12 hours one day. And I really enjoy doing those, um, which, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons why I do personal work. And so I could show a client what I could do, what I'm capable of doing on, on my own time when I have time with talent versus just, you know, 30 seconds or a minute with, you know, with a professional athlete. Because those shots, um, you know, I'm proud of them, but they are what they are. You know what I mean? They're, they're like a two minute uh, portrait session, you know, a five minute portrait session with somebody um, and you do the best you can and you, you execute it. Now, with that being said, now, if, if you know, if I could uh, do another shoot like that, uh, if the budget allows it, um, and, and you could plan it, uh, um, I would definitely do a setup where you have, you know, color and different looks, and that would all be pre-planned. And I laid that all that out, the colors, the complementary colors that I need, the gels, the lights. Um, but again, you need the space for that. You need the time for that. And you need the budget for that. Because when you have a short amount of time, 10 minutes with somebody, you can't set up the lights or bring anything up. You have to have everything pre-lit uh, with your assistant. And when a talent comes, you really just run them through a gauntlet and try to get a good expression of them and shoot everything. Um, so that, that's the, the approach that I do uh, for that. Awesome. We do have another question from Eric. Eric says, great work, just tuned in. How can I expand my portfolio and obtain new clients and models? 
Um, I would I would say uh, to expand your portfolio, um, like I, again, for me, photography is um, it's similar to the analogy to say on directing. You know how to say direct ninety percent of direct is in the casting. Uh, for photography, I would say ninety percent of how good your images look is on the talent you're able to get. So if you want to expand your portfolio um, and and your clientele, I would say uh, work on the people you know, your network and your relationships. Go out and meet new people. Go out and connect with them. Let them know who you are and focus on uh, connecting with them instead of um, you know trying to uh, uh, sell them your product and doing that uh, or selling them a photo shoot. Uh, so if you don't have the portfolio uh, that you're happy with and images that you're happy with and you need to practice, uh, strike up a relationship with someone as an athlete in your gym or, or whatever activities you like doing. I'm assuming the sports because uh, I'm shooting athletes. Uh, but for example, like if you strike up a relationship with a boxing gym and, and photograph all the up and coming boxers, do it for free. Because if you're working on your portfolio book um, and you do it for free and you still need to and you still need to work on finessing your look or practicing your look, um, you have no uh, you have less amount of the stress, whether if you were taking money for a shoot. Uh, so if the images come out great. Right. If they don't like right, there's no hard, you know, like there's no pressure on you because you didn't charge them any money. Uh, so I, I would say that's number one thing, you know, for, for me in general, I would say I, I kind of went backwards in my career, whereas I thought to get good images, you know, you would do just like some magical settings with the camera or lens and stuff like that. And it would make you amazing images. And like I spent, I would say like the first half of my career so far, like learning hardcore and techniques and, you know, lenses, lighting and all that stuff and then post-production. And, um, I would like, was, I to a certain extent, I probably still am the most awkward, socially awkward person with no interpersonal skills. And, um, you know, kind of realizing that I just worked on that, you know, uh, a lot and, and worked on, you know, uh, conversation skills and communicating with people. I'm still certainly a work in progress in that, but I would say that those skills on connecting with people, uh, creating a report, interpersonal skills are much more important, um, in, in my opinion, or at least for me, they were more difficult, uh, you know, to grasp than, than just working on technique and lighting. Because all the stuff that I'm showing you, the lighting techniques and all that, so that, that's pretty easy to do. You could learn that, in my opinion, in a week or so. Um, but like working on relationships and connecting with people, that's a lot lifelong and never, to never um, where, where you got to practice, again, on staying in touch with people, following up, following through, and not getting discouraged if people don't, don't follow up. So uh, to answer that question, to improve your portfolio uh, and get more better clients, just improve your network and, and go out and meet more people. Uh, photograph them. If you're still working on your techniques, uh, offer them, you know, a shoot for free and get safe shots that you know you could get. And then after that, say, okay, cool. I'm going to try something, you know, it's different. I don't know if it's going to work, but if it does, it'll look great. Um, you know, and, and just be upfront with them and let them know that. Uh, Cause if it works, you know, if the idea works great, then awesome. But if it doesn't work, you kind of gave them, you know, the heads up that it might not work and you already got those safe images. Um, and at worst in that situation is that you would learn something and you know now for the next time what you could do to make yourself better. Um, and in, in doing that too, you also got that relationship with that person and you never know the connections or the network that person has where they might be able to refer you and help you out. Awesome, thank you for that. We just kind of touched on this earlier, but maybe you have a little bit more insight um, or wanna speak a little bit further on it, but. Uh, Bijit is, from YouTube is asked, saying, hi, this is great. My question to you is how do you decide the mood? So I don't know if you have anything to add on to what yeah, you said earlier. That's, that's, that's a great question. I love that. So um, uh, on the, the reason why my, the, the work that I, uh, that I do, what motivates me so much is I'm purely going on emotion. So how I, I decide on the mood is I, I literally... Um, interpret how the talent or whoever I'm photographing makes me feel. So I'm literally looking at the person and studying uh, the, the main thing that I love doing when anyone who I get to photograph, like the first thing I did when I, when I got hired to photograph Mario, the boxer, um, is I literally, I just met with them. Um, I don't meet for people with coffee because I don't drink coffee. So I just met them at the gym and I just want to see how they are and how they like being talked to, how they speak, um, see if we could connect, uh, see, see how they are, see their gestures, their mannerisms uh and 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 just want to see what they're about and i interpret how they are how they make me feel visually emotionally like through through the images so that's how i decided on on, on the image if i'm photographing a boxer 
where they're from, who they are. Like Mario Barrios, his nickname is the Azteca, Azteca Warrior. Um, so just how you interpret that, me visually, how that makes me feel, um, and whatever you know, either preconceived notions I have of that, or I'll do research and see what colors are prevalent to what, what that person like. If they have a favorite color, I also ask them too. You know what what they like. Uh, I want to know everything about a person. You know, if they're divorced, what their favorite food is. If they have a dog. Um, and I literally take all of that and I interpret it uh, myself, however I want it, and then I, I execute that visually. Uh, so that that that's how I, I you know I get that that um, that uh, uh, that's how I make the decision on on how to interpret the person, how to express the emotion. Um, and again, another thing that I like to do too is um, I like to say I put my flaws directly into my work. And what, uh, what that means to me is that I've been since a child, like super ADD and I want to do, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. Um, and that's reflected on my work. If you look, when I do one shoot, uh, even if I have a short amount of, of time with a person, I want to do four or five setups. Um, and I like that. I like the variety and I need the variety. Um, you know, unless I'm, I'm down to 30 seconds with a person, you know, I'm forced to do one thing, but even in that situation, I try to do multiple things. Um, but that's just me. Like right? I'm putting myself into my work. Other people and other photographers uh, like certainty and they like to do one thing and they do that one thing or one look really well and they're really successful and they do it over and over again. Again, for me, I, I need to interpret that person, you know, how they make me, how they affect me emotionally. And I just output that visually. And, and that makes it work when I, when I'm allowed to have creative freedom like that, it makes it really cathartic and really satisfying. And that's how I'm able to put, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours in the shoot. Uh, and, and, and get things going. Awesome, I'm gonna come back on video here. Um, we have just about 10 more minutes left, but I did wanna, I have another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you, like, what advice would you give to somebody that's like just trying to get into using lights? I mean, I find that even the photographers that I interact with, it's kind of a hit or a miss. Like a lot of people are, either, will either consider themselves a natural light photographer or they're, you know, all studio light or that's the majority of their workflow. So is there like, how did you get into using studio lights? And obviously you developed that craft to a whole new level now, but what was it like at first, like learning how to use the lights and really like slowing down your process so that you can really understand how light affects an image? Well, I, I got into using studio lights because when, when I first started, I had a, a college um, you know, professor, you know, preached that people look best in natural light. Um, and I ate that up. I bought, it. I used to be an all natural light photographer and shoot with all primes. And uh, until at like seven or 8 PM, I got a, a phone call from a, a, a local music studio here in the Bay Area to photograph um, a well-known local rapper named E40. Um, and it was like, at, I would say like at 8 PM or so at night indoors. And I remember when I got that phone call, I remember thinking, how could I call myself a photographer if I don't have any lights and I don't know how to light? Um, and I just remember that vividly, you know, when I got that call. And then I remember having to rely on a friend of mine that went to college in new lighting, his name was Brandon Smith. And I was like, hey, dude, I got this opportunity. Can you come help me out? And he did. He saved my behind on that shoot. And I remember thinking how dependent I was on him. And telling myself, never again am I going to find myself in a situation like that where I have to rely and depend on someone else where I couldn't do it. And then from that point on, I ended up buying four strobes um, from Palsy Buff I mean, because they were pretty affordable. And I just started learning lighting on my own. And I, um, I realized that quickly from there, then and there that like, you know, natural light is great. But if you need to do this professionally, you need to be able to execute anytime during the day and um and be able to to produce a good image like like in, in that situation like what, what could i have done you know what i mean just just shoot wide open with nasty fluorescent lights from from a studio right Th those images wouldn't have impressed anybody um so that's that situation that's where i had that 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 kind of not epiphany but that turning point where i was like you know what i need to learn lighting and i just bought you know people say start with one light i ended up i bought four and just dove into it head first uh, and started practicing as much as I could and, and learning and didn't stop until I, I, you know, I, I got to where I'm at. But uh, let me go here. I know if there's a good question, if there's any follow-up questions that I don't get to, because I know I have like 10 minutes. Let me get to this part of the conversation. Uh, please, people, hit me up on, on the DM on Instagram. It's just Adelexis Quaresma. 
Um, and I'll be happy to maybe go on live on the B and H uh, Instagram or my account and then answer more of the questions here. But um, I just want to go over a few other things that affect the look and feel of your image, um, which I have I've had up here for a little bit. Where you could, where awesome. You could I'm gonna let you get to it. So if it, like you said, if anybody has any questions, um, put them in the chat. We'll get to them at the end. Yeah, I'd lo I love questions. So please, please uh, uh, ask them. So I'll make you know send me the questions. I'll I'll answer them later. But Things that affect the look in your image are lens selection. Um, and if we have your filtration and obviously lighting, right? That's a big one. But all of these technically, you know, the lighting, they all affect the lighting directly one way or another. So the lens selection on what to consider um, as the characteristics of the lens, uh, the speed in the f-stop that again directly affects your images. If it's a zoom or a prime, again, I know that's another big debate, but it, it's just completely dependent on, on your situation and the look and the focal length. So if you look here, we have two different lenses and this is directly how the lens affects your lighting. So if you look um, right here, the lens, the image on the left here of, uh, of Catherine, that shot with a really modern lens. That's the Canon 28 to 70 F2 lens. That's a really clinical lens. A clinical lens means that it doesn't flare like the one on the right hand side, which you see here, that's a vintage lens. It's a uh, Super Takamar uh, 50 millimeter lens. And that's a vintage lens that flares really beautiful if you're looking for flares. So the lens on the left, that one, I cannot get the lens to flare for the life of me. So if you wanna do anything creative with, the, with flaring or having that look in your image, you have to consider your lens selection. A lot of people think that just because, you know, Canon or whatever company or Nikon uh, come out with a new lens that is better, um, better is subjective. Technically, when they're saying the, the, the image is better, it means that it's more clinical and it has new coating and it has, you know, it's more less prone to flaring. If you're going for a clinical look for something that's really clean, then yeah, those lenses are better. But it's not necessarily, you know, my, that, that might, I don't set out, you know, in, in my creative and, and, you know, shoot or anything that I like to do to make the most clinical looking image. Like I said, in the very beginning, I don't go for something that's, you know, naturalistic to recreate or represent the reality was there. I want to, you know, I want to put some, some emotion and some flavor behind it. And that generally doesn't involve, you know, a, 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 um, lenses that are clinical. And again, this is focal length. <clears throat> a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people tend to prefer uh, telephoto lenses, which is the one on the right, because they say it's quote unquote more pleasing. Um, I prefer, you know, like the image on the on the left hand side here, that's done with the 24 to 105 lens, uh, the Canon F4, which is not a sexy lens, but <clears throat> I prefer that lens much more because when you're in those uh, wider focal lengths, like 35 or 24, you could talk a lot more intimate to your talent, to your subject. I suppose what, if you and, and see anybody do photos, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on a telephoto lens, like the, on the 200N, you, you just literally hear them barking orders of their talent. Uh, while it may more be, while it may be more visually pleasing and it flattens the background, you know, the, the expression or the, the mood that you're going to get from the image is going to be directly uh, reflected on the, on the end result. So for me, I always prefer a much more, you know, intimate, you know, conversation with my talent and I could speak to them, you know, like this instead of yelling at them and barking orders. And uh, this is for filtrations on, uh, on things to consider. Um, Filtration is huge indoors or outdoors, position in the sun, uh, time of day or weather, um, and the mood and lighting that you want. And uh, that's all the filtration and then the color and focus that you want. So these are some of all the filters that I use to get a lot of the look that I want in camera. And kind of here's a whole setup on how the filters affect your look. Uh, so on this one, like I have a, uh, you know, I, I stacked on um, a polarizer and 85 correction filters on the right-hand side. So the three top images on the left um, are done uh, with no filtration and, it, and, the, and it's done just on the adjustments on, the, on, on Lightroom to try to make them uh, you know, match like the bottom ones. And the ones on the, on the bottom is the same exact settings just with the filters on them. Uh, so if you look uh, on there, that have the polarizer on there. One of the things for scouting your, your location when you have a polarizer, if you want a dark dramatic uh, sky uh, or clouds, you need to make sure that the location that you're scouting, they're going to be 90 degrees to the sun because that's when you're going to get the most polarization. And on this one, again, I have an 85 uh, filter on it. That's an orange filter. And uh, what I'm doing on this one is I'm dropping the white balance uh, to 2,500 Kelvin when I have those 85 correction filters on there. 
And what that does is it cancels out the orange filter uh, because even though I'm overcorrecting the orange and I'm making the image extra blue in the computer, I'm oh, sorry, in the camera, um, it balances out, but that orange filter is still in front of the lens. So what that does is it blocks out blue light. And if you look on the image on the right, it, you could make a blue sky almost look completely black during the daytime uh, because you're putting that orange filter that's completely blocking out um, all that blue light. Uh, and again, so this is another combination of all those images right here that I had, like it's a polarizer um, and, and bringing down those skies to get really, really nice, dark, dramatic uh, skies. And again, these are shot during the same time, and I'm just stacking different color filters and overcorrecting the, um, uh, the lights and everything. So let me just show a quick BTS. Um, of that shot so we could see it. And um, and I think we'll end it from, from there to see if we got any additional questions, but um, let me go here. There you go. So I think the video should be showing up here. There you go. So this is just a BTS in that shoe that I did uh, with Vanessa Joy. Uh, hopefully it should be playing, let's see. And you can just see there the um, lights are overcorrected with the gels. I see the video's playing a little choppy, but you'll get the gist of it. So I also have a number of filters in front of the lens and the lights are overcorrected. So they're not the same color as the, um, um, as the filters in front of the camera, but that's the setup and that's the look of that one. And then here's the other image too. The only thing I did on this, um, uh, set up right here is remove the color filters, but I left the polarizer and the other ones so you could get the dark dramatic skies. But that's all done in camera and that all affects the, the look and feel of your images. I see a lot of magnum action. Is that your favorite modifier to use? Um, it's it, 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 to a certain extent, it just depends. Um, it's it's my my go to or my favorite one, I would say, hey, when I'm using B1s because uh, um, those lights only have, um, they're only 500 watt seconds and using the Magnum generally gives you two extra stops of light. And if you look, I was overcorrecting that light uh, with gels. So when you overcorrect it, you lose two stops of light. So it's kind of canceling the extra oomph the, the Magnum gives you. Um, generally, the more power that you have in a light, the more uh, modifications you could do to it. And, um, and, and that's why I love the Magnum because it gives you those extra two stops of light so you could bounce the light, you could correct it, you could gel it and do whatever you want. Because if I didn't have that, then I wouldn't be able to push the F-stop um, or, or gel the light as, as I wanted. Awesome. Uh, we do have two more questions um, from Benjamin. What would, your, what would be your number one general uh, advice for this type of work? I assume uh, in reference to sports photography. <laughs> Um, I would say the number one advice uh, has nothing to do with photography. I, I, I would say relationships, um, relationships and, and, the rela and the people that you know is the number one rule. Um, connect with people, um, go out there, put yourself out there. Um, uh, you know, I, I know I'm kind of bypassing uh, the work, which is really important because um, you should have work. Um, but I would say if you have, out of the two, if you have solid work and no relationships, that's not good. If you have amazing relationships and your work's not there yet, in my opinion, you're in a better place because you have those relationships. And once your work get, gets there, you have those relationships where you could connect and get more work and get more business. So I would say my number one advice for that is to get yourself out there, connect with people, um, talent athletes, whoever, or, or actors, whoever you want to work with and, and start building those relationships. And what are some of your like go-to icebreakers or like conversational pieces? Like how do you first start getting to know somebody? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but is there any, anything specific that you do when you're like meeting somebody for the first time or, you know, how do you approach that? Um, when in person, I, um, you know, it might be a little bit different with COVID now. I generally love, you know, shaking hands with someone and meeting them. Um, but it, it, I would, I would just say literally, you know, that quote that they say showing up is 90% of the work. I, I genuinely believe that's true. Like, um, uh, uh, I mean, the way I got kind of myself out there is, um, I, I had a relationship with Brad Smith, who was the director of photography at SI and I knew him in the New York, uh, for the New York times beforehand. And, um, so I did a few assignments for him there. 
and it went really well. And he sent me an email saying, um, hey, you know, I just want to let you know I'm leaving the New York Times to be the director of photography at Sports Illustrated. Looking forward to continuing our work relationship. And then uh, a few weeks later on Instagram, he posted a photo of the entrance of Sports Illustrated, which looked really nice. And I was like, that's an epic entrance, Brad. And he said, yeah, waiting for you to come visit. I don't know if he was serious or not, but what I did after he made that comment is I went online, I booked my flight to New York for about two weeks. And then I shot on my email the next day and said, hey, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be in New York next week, you know, next month from this day to that date. Let me know when I could come visit. Again, I didn't know if it was serious or not, but I literally just went out, I booked that flight there and I put myself out in New York and, and, I, and I took him up on that offer. So a lot of the times, you know, a, a lot of people w- would say, hey, you know, if you're in town, come visit me or connect with me or let me know. Um, and when people say that to me, I take them up on it. Uh, so I would say that's that's a way to do it because people in general off- generally offering stuff like that to you like that and people never take them up on it. Uh, so when they offer that to me, I 100% dive in and, and make the best of the opportunity, connect with people, follow up with them, you know, uh, meet them. And then when you meet them, you know, ask them, you know, what they like doing, get to know who that person is. Yeah. And, you know, follow them on social media and stay in touch with them. And that's the biggest thing I want to say, uh, because when you meet someone for the first time, it, it, it's great. But like, it, it's much better when, when you connect with them, you know, after the seventh or eighth time, they feel more comfortable and they feel like they know you. Um, and, and I would say, you know, an icebreaker is great, but work on the long term and, and making those relationships last and stay in touch with people. So don't, don't be afraid to show them your work and say, hey, I just shot this, you know, this new, you know, image library for, for you know, this new WBA boxer, Mario Barrios, who has a fight coming up. You know, his publicist hired me. This is some new work. I just, you know, just wanted to share it to you. You know, if you ever need any work like this, let me know. Um, or don't even say that. Just share the work with them and then ask them how they're doing. And, and from doing that, like, that's, that's how you make relationships happen and things happen. Awesome. Really great advice. I have one, one last question. Boxing yeah. or dance? Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't pick. I, I love, but I mean, I would say they're so different, but I would say boxers and dan- principal dancers are um, almost caught from the same cloth because both of those, um, they're, I mean, they're, you know, they, they're so different, but they're also so same in the amount of dedication and sacrifice that, that they have to do. Uh, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't pick one. That, that, that's so hard. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, no, I was really curious to ask you that question. I've been holding it the whole time. Like, I wonder what he's going to say. But your bot, like I said in the beginning, your boxing photos, oh my God, it makes me want to get back in the ring. So <laughs> very inspiring for even the non-professional. Um, I think we're ready to wrap up here. I don't see any um, other questions in the chat as of now. Um, I'm going to, if you're done, Alexis, I'm going to just do a quick screen share, um, of our website and, um, some of the pro photo deals we've got going on, if that's okay with you, um, being that you're a pro photo shooter and all, um, of course. so I'm going to do that in a second. And again, um, I just want to remind everybody if you have any questions, you can email um, my team at bhshows at bhphoto.com. Uh, we can also pass those questions on to Alexis, or you can DM him directly on Instagram. He's also a great person to follow. I follow him myself. I love seeing his work on my timeline. Um, so yeah, please feel free to do that if you have any questions or if anything comes up in the future. And in the meantime, let me just um, share my screen here. Awesome. Do you see your website? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is Alexis's website. Um, You can check out more of his work here. Um, Also, Instagram, have your Instagram up here. It's prompting me to log in, but it is basically your first and last name. Um, For pro photo specials, we are offering right now 5% off um, all pro photo A10 studio flashes, as well as the B10s and the B10 plus uh, flash flashes. So if you go to your cart, if you have a pro photo B10 in the cart, all you have to do is type in BH sports pro photo and apply it. As you can see, the discount is applied down here. 
Um, so you can do that. If you have any questions, again, feel free to email my team. Somebody will drop that email in the chat just in case uh, you're having a problem there. But also with the purchase of the A10, they are giving away um, the Pro Photo Light Shaping Kit for $349. So it's almost, you know, what is that? My math is horrible, but, you know, almost, you know, 50% off, 40% off, something like that. Um, so please, you know, take note of that. And yeah, again, questions or, or any problems with that, feel free to email the team. Again, I mentioned it in the beginning, we do have a deal zone as well. It's a really great thing to know about on our website, Daily Deals, they live right here at the top. So there's always some cool little um, tools on there. And this has been awesome. I'm really, really happy that I've been a part of this. And thank you so much, Alexis, for your time and for Ron as well from earlier, both two great presentations. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Been great. I'm gonna, I don't think I'm missing anything here, but um, thanks everybody for tuning in. And I, oh, one thing I am missing, we have a blog post on the rest of the week. Um, I'm going to drop that in the chat. It was dropped earlier, but you can check out the rest of the programming for the rest of Sports Week. Um, tomorrow, I believe that we have JC Carey from Westcott, as well as Irene Yi, who is a um, professional rock climbing photographer. So that should be very cool. And then on Wednesday, we have... Um, Greg, or is it, we have Thursday, we have Greg and Jen Edney on Wednesday. So, uh, I mean, Thursday, sorry, I think there's a typo on the, on the blog, but Thursday we have uh, Greg and Jen coming on to talk to us. So thank you, Alexis. I'm going to sign off now and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Take care guys. Take care.